It's Friday night once again. Thank you everyone so much for joining us again for Band Together. Hope everyone out there survived the earthquake. I know it was rough, but like we always do here in Sacramento, we will rebuild. Really excited for tonight's show. Uh, if you've tuned into past performances of Band Together, you know we've had uh, several different genres. We've had some rock music, some hip hop, some indie, a lot of different stuff. We are shaking things up a little bit tonight. Uh, tonight we have a group of performers from Empire Arts Collective that are here to perform a variety of different works for us. And we're so happy to have them all here. I could sit here and try to explain what Empire Arts Collective is. That wouldn't really do any good. So to do that, I'm going to welcome in the co-founder and managing director of Empire Arts, Emily Perez. Emily, we're so happy to have you. Welcome. Hello. It's great to see Thanks. you. You too. So tell us about your organization. Uh, what do you guys do? How long have you been around? Give us the rundown. That is a great question. Um, so we've been around from about two, 2015, 2016-ish. Mm -hmm. um, I would say probably like the point where we kind of like entered the public consciousness, let's say, <laughs> uh, is when we did a Hamilton sing-along, like a couple months after Hamilton came out. Um, and we thought it would be like a group of like 10 nerds and it there were 150 people that came. Um, which was both exciting and shocking for us because we were not. That's prepared. awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, but what we do is we're a nonprofit performing arts incubator. Um, so we kind of um, partner up with different people who have performing arts projects that they want to bring to life. And then we work with them to help bring them to life. So we brought to life these Hamilton sing-alongs. Another thing that we're really known for is um, we do an annual performance of Buffy the Vampire Slayer musical, Once More with Feeling. Yeah, they did a musical episode. Yeah, we do it like stage. Like there's a full ballet. It's like a whole thing. I really um, hope my wife is watching this right now. It's her favorite show. So, so yeah, sure. yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, people who love Buffy like love it. So we, we've done that for four years. Um, and a lot of the people that you're going to see on the broadcast today um, participated, have participated in that project in some way. Awesome. Um, and then we have an adult choir. The other big project we have um, that's pretty well known is we have an adult choir um, that sings pop music. Awesome. Yeah. So, and those performances are usually in the spring. Is that correct? Um, the Buffy usually happens around February. The choir performs in normal circumstances three times a year. Gotcha. Yeah. So were you sort of in the cycle of getting one of the pop choir concerts ready when all this came down and the world kind of changed on us? Yes. Our concert was scheduled for the day the stay at home order in place started. So we held our dress rehearsal three Bummer. days before it. And then we canceled it the next We had to cancel the concert the next morning because it became clear that it wasn't going to be safe. Oh, man. But yeah, I, it was like we were, you know, I we're grateful that everyone was safe um, because choirs mm. in particular, it turns out, are kind of dangerous environments because everyone's putting so much air out. Mm hmm. I'm not a scientist, so don't hold me to that. But that's my career. No, we've there there's been stories about that. So you're 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 not off base. Yeah. Definitely. So I'm just relieved everyone in my choir is safe that I know of. But um yeah, it was really heartbreaking because they sounded super good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have, I know it's <clears throat> there's so many challenges, but have you tried to explore ways to do that virtually or or kind of condense it down to the internet thing? Yeah, we've looked into it. I think, <clears throat> you know, one of the tricky things about choir is the drag on the internet makes it really difficult. Lots of people are working with virtual choirs where people send in pre-taped like segments and then someone puts them all together. Mm -hmm. That is really cool, but it requires a lot of tech um, and editing skills. And we really work in the arena of live performances. So we may sure. do something like that in the future, but um, for right now, we're just kind of taking a little hiatus um, <laughs> sure. on live yeah. performances, yeah. Mm -hmm. Understood. So I know uh, Empire Arts has a, a Patreon page, uh, patreon.com slash Empire Arts Collective. You can check that out. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about, I know this is a platform that a lot of performers and artists are starting to utilize uh, in these crazy times. Can you tell us about yours and what it entails? Yeah, so Patreon is really great because it kind of um, is a modern way to do the old patron model, right? Where you mm -hmm. decide on an artist or a group of artists that you really <clears throat> want to support and you basically financially support them. Um, so it allows people to do monthly donations like a dollar or five dollars or, you know, a thousand. If you have, we're totally open to all those amounts. <laughs> mm -hmm. sure. um, and the cool thing is like uh, that you can kind of give like different little rewards for each amount. So one of the things we have is like one of our performers uh, will make personal voicemails for, pe for our patrons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he's an awesome improv actor. Um, he was actually on your show a few weeks ago. So. Um, mm -hmm. 
yeah, it, I have to say I'm really grateful for Patreon and for all the people who support us through that because it is the reason our, 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 that we're, our organization is not currently sunk because like all live performers, like we had months of stuff we were planning and it's all cut now. Yeah. So. Yeah. The world we live in. It's so, totally different. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> in addition to the Patreon, are there ways that people can, uh, can support Empire Arts? Uh, anything in addition to that page? Yeah, we, we have like a regular donation page on our website um, and we're still running different kinds of programming. Like we're taking some time to kind of like see what's the best. We always don't want to duplicate things that other people are doing, you know. Sure. Uh, so uh, we're kind of like playing with the new world and seeing what will make sense. Um, but one of the things we're running, which actually is running tonight, is uh, two of the choreographers that we've worked with on the Vampire Story musical, actually. Every Friday night, they teach a free Zoom class. Um, that you can get to through our Facebook page and they teach a musical theater dance number. So if you awesome. have Broadway dreams, you can now do it for free from the privacy of your home. <laughs> awesome. Very cool. <clears throat> well, Emily, we really appreciate you being here with us tonight. Thanks so much for sharing some information about your organization and for uh, helping to curate uh, this group of performers we have on deck tonight. So thank you yeah. so much. Thank you so much for having us, Sarah, and we really appreciate it. You bet. Take care. So, and with that, we are going to welcome in Lily Tanner, who's the director of a current project that is being worked on by uh, Empire Arts Collective. Lily, how are you? I'm pretty good. How are you doing, Erin? Doing great. And I do have to ask, how is Adam Driver over there behind oh, you? Oh, Adam, um, he's pretty good. Um, it's hard. It's symmetrical. So um, Adam does actually have a response to mm -hmm. shelter in place, if you want to hear it. Absolutely, we do. Yeah, so if you could ask him just kind of like how he feels about shelter in place. Adam, Kylo, Ren, whichever you prefer, can you tell us how you feel about shelter in place? What the fuck? <laughs> That's pretty much how he feels about everything right now. You know, it's a trying time for him. Um, he doesn't, being a pillow, he doesn't normally get to leave the apartment, but now he just really feels the, the pressure, you know? Cool. Well, we were happy to have had Adam as a guest star, but um, let's bring it back to you. Tell us about uh, the project that Empire Arts and, and your troop is currently working on. Yeah, totally. So um, I'm uh, so I'm the director of A Familiar Feeling, which is a devised piece of theater about ghosts and families and sacramental history. And um, this piece, we were we had auditioned and then we were one week into rehearsals um, before the shelter in place um, uh, order, <laughs> the lockdown happened. Every time I try to talk about like the quarantine, it sounds so dramatic, but then it's like, no, those are the real words that we're using, right? Like it is a lockdown, you know? Um, but so we've been rehearsing virtually um, what we've been doing so, a familiar feeling is a devised piece of theater, um, which means that we are creating the the show kind of like uh, like we're building the plane in the air, right? Mm -hmm. So we're working on creating this play together. And so we've been able to do, um, we've been doing weekly uh, rehearsals on Google Hangouts. And then we've also been doing movie nights. Um, once a week, we watch ghost movies together. Um, so... Uh, what you're going to hear today um, is a lot of the, the actors are going to be, um, we've been doing different kind of like writing prompts and exercises to create material. So they've kind of created different characters based off of um, different time periods in Sacramento history and um, different like, uh, one thing we really wanted to explore was kind of like uh, moments of redemption in the ghost cycle, right? So like mm -hmm. um, the point at which a ghost gets to decide that they don't have to be a ghost anymore. Um, so we've been working with that um, concept a lot because what I really wanted in this production was to make a story about ghosts that isn't frightening because I'm very mm -hmm. interested in ghosts, but I'm also a big Frady cat. So I was like, we need to make a play that I can watch. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so we've been working on that. And one thing I wanted to mention is you're gonna hear from the cast tonight. One member of our cast was not able to to due to scheduling conflicts. Jerry Kennedy has been doing a lot of really good work for us uh, that he's uh, was unable to attend tonight. So I just wanted to shout him out. Um, but yeah, I think you're gonna be really in for a treat. You're gonna get to hear um, some poems, some songs, some short stories, and a little bit about the process behind all of those things. 
Wonderful. And I understand we're going to start this out with a ghost oath, which I don't yes. think any of us know what that is, correct? Definitely. Yeah. So a ghost oath. Um, so people have been asking me like, you know, because they know I talk a lot. Um, I don't know if you could tell, but um, <laughs> so they know that I'm interested in ghosts and people ask me like, do you believe in ghosts? And my response is like, whether I believe in ghosts or not, if a ghost is there, it's going to be there, right? Mm -hmm. So um, we created a ghost oath um, to tell ghosts, if they're listening, that we respect them. And also so that we don't have a curse put upon us. Because always in theater, it's very important to be respectful of the people who you're representing and the characters and kind of like where they're coming from. But especially with a ghost, because a ghost can put a curse on you or haunt you, you know, which mm -hmm. sometimes that's okay. Um, and sometimes maybe it's not what you want. So with that, um, I'm gonna bring up uh, one of our cast members is gonna help me do the oath. And then I think you're gonna talk to him a little bit more, right? Yeah, the stage That's is yours, Lily. Perfect, thank you. Okay, we're gonna get Robert out here. Hi, Robert, how are you doing? Hello, I'm doing well, how are you? I'm great, thank you. Um, are you, you're looking good, very dappled. Wow, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I like um, your sparkly top. Thank you. I bought it. Wow. Yeah, really? it's pretty impressive, I think. Um, uh, so let's do the our oath. Um, okay. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, we're going to breathe in. And out. We're engaging the diaphragm. And in. As we step As we forward, step forward in, this in this activity, activity we, declare we declare solemnly that we have that nothing, we have but, nothing respect but respect for ghosts slash, slash people of the past. Of the past. We, are we are theater makers and storytellers, and storytellers who strive to who operate, strive to without operate within sentimentalism or sentimentality. Or sentimentality. We only wish to we observe, only wish and, observe and reflect this world and, all of, and all of its inhabitants. Okay, so I think anyone who's listening knows that we respect them. And I think our soul is, our souls are sealed now. Um, I know that the whole cast also did this backstage. So that's very exciting. Uh, I'm going to let you go, Robert. And then you're going to talk to Aaron, okay? Sounds great. Uh the oath has been taken. Robert, how you doing? Thanks so much for being here. Doing good. How are you doing, Aaron? Doing good. So uh, tell us, it, we know you're, you're part of the cast with uh, Empire Arts and part of the cast of A Familiar Feeling. What else are you doing to uh, sort of pass the time in, the, in these crazy COVID times? Well, uh, in general, I'm messing around with all sorts of computer uh, audio mixing kind of stuff to, to make little fun, fun things. But I've got a project going on actually with uh, Lily currently. Um, uh, we do this uh, thing called socially distance reading where we uh, we take a book and we just sort of read that book and narrate it and do fun voices and things like that for all the different characters that we go through it. We just went through uh, Phantom Tollbooth um, most recently and uh, now we're here uh, moving into a Terry Pratchett book called The We Free Men that we just started on Wednesday. Beautiful. Uh, tell us a bit about the, uh, the piece you're about to perform for us, The Ballad of Cecilia uh, Jones. Uh, yeah, so uh, we did this exercise that's really similar to MASH. Uh, do you know that game? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so instead of saying, you know, where am I going to live? How much am I going to make? And looking into your personal future, it's kind of turned on its head and it's looking into another person's history. Um, and so we, we took that concept and we're given things like uh, age, race, ethnicity, time period, gender, occupation, and of course, how that person died. Um, and here's where it gets fun. Uh, we were just told to come up with these ideas. And then after we came up with them, we were told that uh, it is going to be our ghost that we're going to write a song for, um, which allowed for a lot of really creative things to come out of it because people weren't thinking about that. Um, so what we wrote a song for them about was uh, a ghost basically speaking in some way. Um, there's all sorts of ways that a ghost might communicate, um, you know, poltergeist might uh, bang out some sounds and that could be a song in, in and of itself. Um, but uh, what I made was a character called uh, Celia Jones. She is a 32 year old Native American woman from the late Gilded Age and she fell in love with dirigible, dirigible piloting, but she had to secret it away because she was a woman and misogyny exists. And uh, the song I wrote is basically her story. 
Oh, Wonderful. and I should also mention that she is allergic to nuts. <laughs> All righty. Well, Robert, we will turn the stage over to you for the ballot of Celia Jones. Thank you. All right, everyone. Uh, this is the ballad of Celia Jones. Miss Celia Jones, Miss Celia Jones, I'll never say no to Miss Celia Jones. Here is a story about Celia Jones, who now shines high above her bones. Will I ever fly, soar above the sky? to bounce along the dirigible clouds and finally make myself proud. Anointed by the captain, left to blinker with his vodka, so I ran home to gunpowder where she stuffed my face in chowder. She said I wasn't rum, she said I should just shut my bone box, but I hoistened up my bellows and shooed away the fellows. Scandal water tossed my timber, truly saw, and I took my perpendicular with the rib who keeps a phone. And she said, Oh, Celia Jones, oh, Celia Jones, why let them say no, my Celia Jones? Make your own story, Miss Celia Jones, and listen not a word to haggard old crones. I know you will fly, soar above the sky. You'll tread along the eagle's way and find that golden path someday. The captain's words in my pocket sit upon to replace a course that I became a kind of hugger mugger hobbity hoy. I sold the man a dog and left to take the egg, but a gas pop wearing lads saw through to my two legs. A nose and the floor left his prime people's poor, a buddy popped a finger out and pointed at my drawers. And he said, your Celia Jones, yes, Celia Jones. I couldn't rat out Miss Celia Jones, for there is not a one like Celia Jones who bats away society stones. I'll sneak you in to fly, you soar above the sky. You'll release your shroud and show them once so very loud. My Celia Jones, my Celia Jones, you're looking mighty peckish, my Celia Jones. Just have a couple nuts, my Celia Jones, cause you look quite like skin and bones. Why, oh, why do you sigh? Your eyes welled up to cry. Why are you turning red? My God, I think she's dead. I'm Celia Jones. I'm Celia Jones. But now you probably guessed I'm Celia Jones. I know it's kind of sad to be Celia Jones. But now I get to haunt your souls when you fly up high, soaring through the sky. You'll see the engines burst in flame because of all your sexist shame. When a gal sneak a shit starts to throw a fit, you can bet his respirator just won't deploy. Don't play my 15 puzzle if you're not up to dick, cause I'll send you to the ground, you mafficking prick. So when you see a birdie fly to light a bickerous sky, you never knew why that family had to die. And you just wanted to try, but you're left with a lie. It's Celia Jones, Celia Jones, Celia Jones. Jones, Robert, thank you so much for 
giving us a digital stage tonight. We love having you. Thank you so much. Thank you. You bet. Take care. Uh, thank you again, Robert. We are now going to move along and welcome in Sandy Lang. Sandy, we are so happy to have you. How are you? I'm doing good. Thank you, Aaron, for having us tonight. You bet. <clears throat> so, Sandy, uh, tell us a little bit about the piece that you have on deck tonight. What are we What are we going to hear? Um. So, going off with what Robert said, we did like this whole mash project, and then we were supposed to write a song about um, the uh, character. Then the second thing that we were given is to write a letter from that character to um, someone else in their life. And um, it's this project that Lily got from a book titled Drama Games for Devising by Jessica Swale. And um, basically what it is, is um, we each had a, um, a number that we were given and each number coincides with character A or character B. And so, for this specific project that Lindsay and I are going to be reading from, um, Lindsay had character A and then person two had character B and then person three had character A and then person four had character B. So character A and B kept going down the line and each person had to write from one of the two characters. So it was a really fun project. Excellent. Well, we are extremely excited to uh, hear it with your partner in crime, Lindsay Molino. Lindsay, Hello. welcome. Hello. Thank you. Welcome. And we will turn the stage over to Sandy and Lindsay. Thank you both so much. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you. All right. Um, Lindsay, did you want to give like a little backdrop onto the, your characters that you created? Oh, sure. So um, character A is Angelica. Um, she's 20 years old and it's 1964. Um, she's a writer and a hopeful bookstore owner uh, in Grass Valley. And she is writing letters to her sister, Amelia, um, who Sandy will be reading the letters of. Um, and then the other person to note is Daniel, who is um, uh, Angelica's partner. Sorry, my character's partner. <laughs> Here we go. Letter number one, Grass Valley, California. October 18th, 1964. Amelia, I, I know you don't wanna hear this, but Daniel has my heart. He and I were married last month in a field of wildflowers, surrounded by only a few friends. How I wish my family were there to celebrate in my joy. However, all of you insisted that a 20 year old couldn't love enough to marry. I know, women power, don't give in to a man. Listen, I get it. Honestly, so does Daniel, but you won't even begin to see that, will you? Well, he and I made the decision. Whether my family decided to disown me or not, we belong together. I do not and will not regret my decision. However, I couldn't help but cry before the ceremony. My only sister refused to talk to me because of a man, a man that I love. All I ever wanted was for you to be proud and the happiest I've ever been in my life and you don't care. So I wept without your presence, but I'll be fine. Daniel and I will be immensely happy with our future bookstore and our future children. I know it isn't the big life you wanted for me, but I hope one day you can be happy for us because we're happy. So happy in fact that I wish to set our differences aside and I wanna invite you and our parents to share Thanksgiving at our home. I wanna show you and them that we weren't foolish. And I also wanna share some incredible news. Don't tell, but the rabbit died. Please be excited for me, Amelia. It would mean the world to share this blessing with you. Your little sister, Angelica. Letter number two, Sacramento, California, October 28th, 1964. Angelica, I can't believe you. You are always the type to venture into flights of fancy, but this, a field of wildflowers and a secret ceremony just because you wanted to just maybe let your life happen before you tied it up with someone else's? Why move to the country and abandon everything you've ever wanted for yourself? Because of what the neighbors might think? That's why you're making a trade, your dreams and your future for a nice small country life of security. But it's a fraud. You can't trade for something that no one can give you. Your mind is so bright 
but you're throwing it away to be some kind of sad shop owner in a dead end corner of the world. Have fun selling your Mary Shelley and your Jane Austen to those close minded rural types. How's old farmer Johnson like in that hot off the pre presses feminine mystique? You could have written the sequel, but instead your love is making you a middle woman and wasting all of that potential. Bad things will still happen. Bad luck will find you, except you won't be sustained by your passions and spirit. By then, those will all be dulled and useless, and you'll be so busy with the pack of brats that you won't read, and you certainly won't write. The little sister I knew refused to be an accessory to other people's lives, but here you are now hiding away from everything that you could ever be with a man who you barely know outside of puppy love. I wish I could be happy about being an aunt, but this just affirms my belief that your whole relationship is based on a huge childish mistake. You are both far too young to be parents. It breaks me so to watch you have buried yourself into this life. Locked yourself into a dead end town with a baby and an ambitious husband. I just, I don't know how to support you. Good luck wasting away as his brood mare at the edge of the world. You're going to need it. Amelia. Letter number three, Grass Valley, California, December 20th, 1964. Amelia, I would have hoped to have heard from you by now. I expected an apology letter shortly after your incredibly demeaning and unwarranted barrage of insults toward my new life, which is happening differently than you and the family had anticipated. And that is, I can only imagine why you're upset or you're just jealous that I found something so pure and so genuine and all you have are your two cats in a one bedroom apartment, a woman of a certain age living by herself, what are people to think, Amelia May? Daniel and I have settled into our small life quite nicely. Yes, he works hard, but so do I. In fact, I've just finished the first draft, first draft of a novella. The country, as it turns out, has been soothing and nurturing for my writer's mind. It hurts me so much that you can't accept that I'm pregnant. My brat is a blessing. And as the baby's aunt, you should love it unconditionally. I know that you think we are young, but you underestimate me, sister. All I know is that there is love in my heart and that is all we need. It is becoming clear to me that you may always see me as a child. I don't need you to talk sense into me. It is you that needs to come to your senses. Tell father and mother that I love them. I guess this means I won't see you for Christmas either. Angelica. Letter number four, Sacramento, California, April 3rd, 1965. <sighs> Dearest little sister, I am so crushed. I can't even find the words to describe it. Daniel telephoned this morning with the news of your passing and that of your baby girl. I've struggled for hours now with how to express, express my deep regret for my behavior towards you this past several months and could only think to write them down in a letter that I'll drop in your grave when we bury you. I should have insisted that when you said you were pregnant that you return to the city immediately. I will never forgive myself for leaving you in the care of that country bumpkin and hack of a doctor, even if he was Daniel's uncle. How could he have missed that your child had died inside of you and was rotting from the inside out? I'll never know. Father has already engaged his lawyers and we will make that man wish that he had never laid eyes on you. I need you to know that no matter how angry I was with you, I never stopped loving you. I wanted nothing more than for you to realize what a mistake you had made and just come home. I'm so sorry for my unkind words. I only wanted to protect you. And I realize now what a failure I was at my most important job, being your big sister. I love you, Angelica. And I don't know how to cope with the fact that I'll never see you again. I hope wherever you are that you have found peace. Always your big sister, Amelia. <clears throat> Letter number five, Sacramento, California. April 20th, 1965. Amelia, I can see you now in your home. I wish I could move on, but I'm still on earth. Now that I'm dead, things are clearer. I was so naive when I was alive. You were right about how young I was. 
the three of you were upset that I got married young. You were upset because Daniel is black. And I thought we lived in a new America, one that valued everyone equally, but I was wrong. I died in an America that shriveled my soul. Just like my baby died because Daniel's uncle wasn't given proper medical training. No one thought he was smart enough to learn. He was. You and everyone like you were just too stupid to teach him. I wish you had the love in your heart that you say you had for me. I wish that you had that love for Daniel too. Now oh, he's alone again. Gone because of our nation's ignorance and fear. I trusted my heart. If only everyone else had too. Angelica. Letter number six, Grass Valley, California, May 15th, 1967. Dearest Angelica, it has taken me two years of grieving and waiting to finally give you answers. And I have felt you every step of the way. And I have realized a few things. One, you were right about father and mother. It wasn't because you were young. It was because Daniel was black. They took him to court, but their case had no grounds. Daniel is alive and well and not in jail. I was appalled at their behavior throughout the whole trying time. I cannot even begin to tell you the pain I felt as father and mother were trying to take down your new family. And two, dear little sister, I was blinded by our parents. I told you I hated the situation because you were too young. Dear sister, I was jealous, but not because I actually hated him or wanted him to be different. It was because he was taking you away from me. I wanted more time for you to be my best friend. And instead of just coming forward with that, I got resentful and I pushed you away. It is the worst mistake and the biggest regret of my entire life. And I am so incredibly sorry. I have since had a good relationship with my brother-in-law. I have moved to Grass Valley and I have grown to love this place too. And I have severed ties with father and mother. I'm still sticking up for the little guys and pushing the boundaries of activism. <laughs> You'd be rolling your eyes at me, but I'm proud of this rural town. And you were right, the scenery in this place, there's something magical here. Daniel still misses you, something awful. But he and I have found comfort in the little pieces of you that we find in each other. I've met someone, Angelica. She is kind, she is fierce, and she is wonderful. Daniel met her the other day and he made me cry, saying Angelica would have been so happy for you. She would have loved her. It was a confirmation from the person who knew your heart the best. And most of all, Angelica, we found your present. Deep within the shelves and hidden within the book jackets, we finally did a full dust through of this little shop. And your money? It came pouring out of all the little tiny nooks and crannies hidden within the pages, like little love notes you left for Daniel. I'm so sorry for everything, but I hope that this letter can find you even a little bit of comfort. Daniel's doing okay. I am doing okay. We miss you beyond belief. Please rest well, dear sister, forever yours, Amelia May. Sandy Lang, Lindsay Molino. Thank you both so, so much for that. Thank beautiful. you. Thank you. Sandy, we're going to say goodnight to you and hang on to Lindsay for a second. And Lindsay, you have a song for us, I understand. Can you tell I us? I do. Yeah. What are, what are we going to hear? So um, this character, Angelica, is, as everyone described, um, the character that I came up with. Um, and the songs that we wrote, we came up with the characters, we wrote the songs, and then we wrote the letters. So in my version of Angelica's history, um, the child lives and she is stuck on the earth because she needs Daniel to find this money that she's hidden within their bookstore. And of course, as the letters were written by the other cast members, they had no idea what my version of the story was. So, you know, it changed over time. But in the song, which was written before the letters, um, I am trying to reach Daniel to let him know that the money is there. And I also talk about our daughter, Daisy, who is alive in my version of the story. Wonderful. The song is Hidden Will You Hear Me? Lindsay, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Daniel, can you hear me? Will you hear me? Oh, Daniel. 
Never in our lives did we keep secrets, but Daniel, my husband, I kept a few. Our treasure's non-existent, except where it counts. Inside the shelves I hid for you. Oh, Daniel, can you hear me? Will you hear me? Oh, Daniel, you laughed at me when I wanted a plan, but Daniel, that plan, will save you and Daisy, my Daisy, our beautiful girl. She needs you. She needs you to hear me. Please hear me. Oh, Daniel, can you hear me? Will you hear me? Oh, Daniel. Hidden in these shelves, hidden from your view, between the dust, between the jackets, the ends are decoys, they hold the treasure. Behold what I have left for you. Oh, Daniel, can you hear me? Will you hear me? Oh, Daniel. Lindsay Molino, thank you so much. And uh, Thanks, thank you to your to your partner, Sandy Lang, for those performances. It's great to have you here. Thank you. Thanks. Good night. Take care. We are now pleased to move along and introduce Danny Walsh. Danny, likewise, great to have you here. How are you? Yeah, good. How are you? Wonderful. Tell us what you have in store tonight uh, about your character and this piece you're going to perform. Yeah, so um, it's a these are this is a different character than what we created with um, the songs and letters. Um, we were given a website called Calisphere. Um, so it's all different pictures of like old California towns and lots of history in there. And through that, I created a character. Her name is Clara Jo Walker, and she is an auctioneer and she lives in East Sacramento. And I created a speech that she's giving later on in her life. And then a fellow cast member, Teresa, she created a poem, which I'll also read for you at the end. Wonderful. Danny, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's, it's truly an honor. I've, I've never gotten an award before. This is such an amazing gift to be recognized in my field. I've always been a fast talker and never been at a loss for words. Gosh, this is, this is so much. First of all, I want to thank the Auctioneers of America for putting on these awards and the Sacramento Convention Center for hosting these awards. Some of you may wonder who this old lady is in front of you. And to those of you who don't know, see me at the bar for a drink. <laughs> I'm Clara Jo Walker and I love auctions. And uh, you might think that after I won this, this old girl is going to retire, but I'm going to win next year too. To those of you coming up in the game of auctions, the committee asked me to give you some advice. First, never leave an auction without getting paid. Second, always keep mints on you at all times. Third, never skip a morning cup of coffee. It's the secret to a fast auction. <laughs> on a final note, I wanna give you all some friendly advice uh, to watch out because I'm gonna be coming back strong next year. Thank you. And drinks are on Auctioneers of America. And the poem that I'm about to read was written by Teresa and she was just given my speech. And the idea that we play with is that ghosts are stuck in time and they're stuck in their reality. And they often are replaying what, you know, some of their last moments were or some of the more proud moments or even the most traumatic. And so with these poems, we really wanted to kind of echo that in that all of the words that were put into the poem are words from my speech. And so it kind of plays on the fact that ghosts often don't have you know, control over what they're saying. They're just repeating themselves. Beautiful, thank you, Danny. All yours. <laughs> Thanks. <clears throat> you may wonder who this old lady is in front of you. I've always been a fast talker, never been at a loss for words, recognized in my field, give you some advice. Never leave an auction without getting paid. Keep mints on you at all times. Never skip a cup of coffee. Watch out because I'm winning. See me at the bar for a drink. I'm gonna win next year too. Watch out. Thank you. Danny, thank you so, so much for joining us and for the performance and I really appreciate it. And yeah. hope, you're, hope you're well and staying safe through all these crazy times. 
You too. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Danny Walsh, uh, thanks for joining us. And we are pleased to move to our final performer of the evening, Miss Teresa Edmonds. Teresa, how are you? Hi, I'm doing pretty great. How are you? Doing great. Thanks so much for being here. So you have a few songs on deck for us. Is that right? Yeah, I'm going to sing a few songs. I'm part of the of Familiar Feelings cast, but I'm also mm -hmm. a singer-songwriter that works with Empire Arts a whole bunch. So uh, I'll do the song that I wrote as, as the ghost exercise, and then I'm just going to keep on going and sing a couple more while I'm here. Fantastic. Thanks so much for being here. The stage is yours. Thank you. So my ghost, uh, her name is Abigail. And I'm actually a Sacramento transplant. And so when I first moved here, I just fell completely in love with the foothills, of the Sierra Nevadas. So I wrote this character to be a rancher and farmer that worked in around 1890. And her great grief that uh, turned her into a ghost is that she had this unrequited love for a woman down the road that because it was 1890, she had to keep to herself. So she poured all that love into her love of the foothills. So this is called Golden Hills. myself like a good old crone wind comes through and cuts the bone walking these golden hills i work until my back could break hauling hay from the moment i wake but it's nothing next to my heartache walking these golden hills Ooh. Ooh. without a trace never knowing your sweet embrace but as long as i think of your face i'm walking these golden hills walking these golden hills i'm walking these golden hills <laughs> so that is golden hills uh as part of the uh a familiar feelings exercise but uh, as I mentioned, I am a singer songwriter. And so when we went into shelter in place and all the gigs got canceled, I started um, doing a series I call my karaoke Corona concert <laughs> on my social media on Instagram and Facebook. And I, a couple times a week, three times a week, I just sing a karaoke song, kind of just trying to, you know, keep it going, spread some love wherever I can. Uh, and uh, I have to say that doing this series has made me very sensitive to lyrics in a whole new way. Songs sound different to us right now. So in this moment where we are all just longing for each other, longing for a human connection, I just thought, I mean, what better time for a torch song, right? So I'm going to sing um, The Man I Love. Well, I'm going to sing it to a track, but, you know, tech in our <laughs> current moment. Okay. Someday he'll come along, the man I love, and he'll be big and strong. The man I love And when he comes my way I'll do my best to make him stay He'll look at me and smile I'll understand And in a little while seems absurd I 
know we both won't say a word Maybe I shall meet him Sunday Maybe Monday He'll build a little home Just meant for two From which I'd never roam Who would, would you? And so I'll answer bound I'm waiting for the man I love Someday he'll come along The man I love And he'll be big and strong The man I love And when he comes my way I'll do my best to make him stay He'll look at me and smile I'll understand And in a little while He'll take my hand And though it seems absurd I know we both won't say a word Maybe I shall meet him Sunday Maybe Monday Maybe not Still I'm sure to meet him one day will be my good news day he'll build a little home just meant for two from which i'd never roam who would would you and so i'll else above i'm waiting for man I love oh yeah the man I love <laughs> okay oh hi Aaron thanks for coming hi to switch my track <laughs> <laughs> no problem and your last song is called hard times is that right it's called hard times this is an old Stephen Foster song and it's usually sung as kind of a hymn but um I'm a bit of a uh, rebellious spirit myself. And so uh, in this moment, I wanted something that was almost like a protest march, you know? And mm -hmm. so we are all going through some real hard times right now. And I wanted to arrange this number to, to be like a foot stomper. We are sending the devil back to hell. So <laughs> that, that's the spirit yeah. I'm trying to bring to these hard times. Beautiful. Can't wait to hear it. Thank you. Let us pause in life's pleasures and count its many tears While we all sob sorrow with the poor There's a song that will linger forever in our ears Oh, hard times come again no more Tis the song, the sigh of the weary Hard times, hard times Come again no more Many days you have lingered All around my cabin door Oh, hard times Come again no more While we seek mirth and beauty And music light and gay There are frail forms fainting at the door 
Though their voices are silent, their pleading looks will say, Oh, hard times come again no more. Tis the song, the sigh of the weary. Hard times, hard times come again no more. Many days you have lingered all around my cabin door. Oh, hard times come again no more. There's a pale sorrowed maiden who toils her life away with a worn heart whose better days are o'er. Though her voice would be merry to sighing all the day, oh, hard times come again no more. Tis the song, the sigh of the weary. Hard times, hard times come again no more. Many days you have lingered all around my cabin door. Oh, hard times come again no more. It's the sigh that is wafted across the troubled way. It's the wail that is heard upon the shore. It's the dirge that is murmured around the lowly grave. Oh, hard times come again no more. Tis the song, the song of the weary. Hard times, hard times, come again no more. Many days you have lingered all around my cabin door. Oh, hard times, come again no more. Oh, hard times, come again no more. Oh, hard times, come again no more. It's a song for our time and place indeed, Teresa. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like that song warrants having like 50 people on stage with you at the same time, but yeah, for, you know, in a world of being isolated, that was fantastic. Well, I'll just have to stomp our feet at home. Exactly, as well, <laughs> we should all. Thank you so much for being here and for your songs. Thank you very beautiful. much for having me. Thank you, take care. Again, a huge, huge thank you to all of our performers tonight. Uh, again, this was the Empire Arts Collective, the device, <clears throat> excuse me, the device theater piece they're working on is called A Familiar Feeling, and you can support Empire Arts Collective by logging on to their Patreon page, www.patreon.com slash empireartcollective. Thank you to uh, Familiar Feeling director Lily Tanner, to founder Emily Perez for bringing all the performers to us tonight. We had a great time. Thank you. Uh, we're back next week. Our friends over at Holy Diver have put together a lineup for us. We've got Adrian Ballou, Dalton James, and St. Juniper all, all scheduled to perform. So looking forward to seeing you all next week. Lo local musicians, local artists, find me on Instagram, uh, A Davis underscore three to C. If you're planning live streams, uh, any releasing new music, let me know what you're up to for the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, three to C music column. Thanks so much again to Empire Arts Collective and to all of you for watching. Good night.